and uh, Ustream. Amen. And so get your Bibles in your hand as we get ready to go forward with our Bible declaration on one accord in this place this morning. Let us lift it and declare. This is my Bible. This is my sword. My instructions for life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I shall hear it, receive it, apply it, and obey. Share it with others who don't know the way. My heart is open, so have your way. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, asking that you will be with us as we go forward in our uh, 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 the word of God that you are prepared for this service. So, God, I pray that everyone in this room will be able to understand what it is that you desire to speak to us on today. Father, in the midst of everything that is said and done, you alone be glorified. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I was saying adjust it. Adjust it because it's adjust that because it's getting so much ceiling. That's what I'm saying. The Facebook Live one, amen. And so, not that one, the other one. Glory to God, amen. Glory to God, amen. And so, we're going to move forward in the Word of God, amen. Uh, last week, we had a wonderful word that was preached, amen, by Elder Janetta. And you know, sometimes when a word is being preached, certain things stir up in your spirit. <laughs> I mean, you start getting all type of revelation and things of that nature. Oh, let me tell you something. When we left it Wednesday night, Pastor Mitchell was preaching. He was just in a zone talking about the, the service that we had in Bible study. And I'm trying to tell him, you need to just write that down because you're just flowing. I mean, he was flowing, would not stop. And so that happens sometimes when somebody's delivering a message or something is going forward. Things will spark in your spirit. And so it stirred something inside of me. The teaching on last week when she uh, concluded her message talking about wisdom. Amen. And so when you think about it, wisdom is everything. Wisdom is everything. Wisdom can protect you from foolish mistakes. If anybody watched my Facebook post after that, earlier this week, I post a, 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 a statement talking about a fool you know, as it pertains to wisdom. And so wisdom is everything. It can protect you from foolish mistakes. Uh, wisdom can heal you if you've been damaged. Amen? How many of y'all know wisdom speaks? Yeah. Turn your Bibles, if you can, to uh, Proverbs chapter 1. We will look at that scripture again today. Proverbs chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 1. And I'm reading this from the New King James Version of the Bible. Proverbs chapter 1, starting at verse 1. When you get there, say, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Amen. I, I want to hear that again. Amen. That's the title of today's message. Amen. So when you get there, I want you to say, don't be a fool. Real loud. Don't, don't be a fool. All right. All right. Y'all sounding good. Amen. And so when you think about wisdom, you need to understand that wisdom is and instructions go what? Hand in hand. They go hand in hand. So Proverbs chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to Give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man, say a wise man. A wise man, a wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Everybody on one accord, read the next part. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So as I said, wisdom and instruction go hand in hand. Let me define for you on this morning what wisdom is. Wisdom is the ability to 
judge correctly and to follow the best course of action, okay? To follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding. How many of you know that you can be brilliant? You can be gifted in some areas in your life, but lack wisdom in other areas, amen? And so when you are smart enough to realize that, you will then humble yourself and seek wise counsel. When you understand that there are some areas that you just simply are not wise in, you will humble yourself and do what the Word of God says, because it says a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Fools, however, reject wisdom. Fools straight up reject wisdom. And most of the time, they definitely won't seek wise counsel. Amen? And so, fools have repeated cycles over and over again. Same stuff, different day. Fools have repeated cycles. And so, the word says fools despise wisdom and instruction. Well, let's talk about what a fool is. Uh, Shirley, come to the front. Sid Lee, come to the front. Uh, Jeffers, come to the front. Just, oh, babies. Uh-huh. Just, just, just quickly. Just quickly. Uh, uh, stand up here because people up there may want to actually see you. In your own words, you give me, you first, Sid Lee. Don't be sliding over there to the middle. You first. In your own words, when you, what is a fool? That when you tell them something like good advice, they don't listen, they do their own thing, and they fall into trouble. That's what I think a fool is. Okay. What do you think a fool is, Jeffers? A fool. A fool is someone who does a mistake and someone tells them about it and knows that it's wrong and they still do the mistake over again. Okay, all right, that's good. And and and, and Miss Shirley. I feel the same. A fool is just someone who chooses to do whatever they want to do despite the knowledge. Amen. Can y'all put your hands together for them because they all gave great answers. You're going to have a seat. And so I want to define for you on this morning what a fool is. A fool is a person who lacks good sense or judgment. Lacks good sense. You know, a lot of times I'm, com- I'm known for saying common sense ain't common. Common sense ain't common. You got a lot of people that are intelligent and things that they should give them, but they lack common sense. A fool is a person who lacks good sense and judgment. A fool is one with a marked, hear this, a marked propensity or fondness for something. Like love, for example, if you think about it. And of course you all know me, songs come to my head. And so a fool in love, that's a song by Tina Turner and Ike Turner. And so when you think about it, keep in mind the definition of a fool. A fool is one with a marked propensity or fondness for something. Often something that's not good for them. Often something that they don't really need. It's almost like a fool for candy when you think about it. When I looked up the definition, it said a fool for candy. And when you think about it, when you understand uh, candy, and if it's something that you just eat on a continuous basis, you know that's going to have a negative effect on you. Amen? Your mouth going to be all jacked up because candy will destroy your teeth. And so but if you're a fool for candy, you can know I got cavities. I, I'm, I'm cavity prone. My teeth sensitive. You know, I haven't had any feeling, but you still going to eat the candy. When, when, when you stop being a fool, you make some adjustments. Oh, I look at some candy. How many of y'all remember squirrel nuts? Guess what? I ain't a fool no more. Especially in my older age and all the work that I had in my mouth. Guess what? I will not eat a squirrel nut. Because all the work that I had done in my mouth, it may come out with the squirrel nut. But if you are a fool, you may know that this may pull out everything in my mouth, but I'm going to eat it anyway. Again, a fool has a marked propensity of fondness for something. And as I said, like love for instance. So I want to share with you some of the double-minded lyrics from the message called A Fool in Love. It says, there's something on my mind. Yeah, good. I got to get into my Tina Turner mode. Won't somebody please tell me what's wrong? But I'm not going to 
on the scene. But if you think about it, next thing you know, you got the background singers that are start singing to her, right? This is what they're singing to her. They saying, you're just a fool. You know you're in love. You got to face it to let it explode. You take the good along with the bad. Sometimes you're happy and sometimes you're sad. You know you love him. You can't understand why he treats you like he do when he's such a good man. Y'all know they were singing those lyrics with a lot of sarcasm. And even if you remember the movie, after you know some things took place and she was singing that song, it wasn't one of those ones with a lot of joy with it because she dealt with a lot of stuff with this man. So that's what they actually say. Now here she goes with her response to those lyrics. We talking about a fool, right? He got me smiling when I should be ashamed. Got me laughing when my heart is in pain. Oh no, I must be a fool because I do anything he wants me to do. And so they say again, you're just a fool. You know you're in love. You got to face it to let it explode. You take the good along with the bad. Sometimes you're happy and sometimes you're sad. You know you love him. You can't understand why he treats you like he do when he's such a good man. Then she responds back. Without the man, I don't want to live. You think I'm lying, but I'm telling you like it is. He's got my nose open, and that's no lie. And I'm going to keep him satisfied. A fool. When you hear those lyrics, she already knows what ain't good for her, but she has a marked propensity or fondness for him. That's the definition of a fool. Because fools are foolish, go to Proverbs chapter 12. Because fools are foolish, they don't want wisdom and instruction because they think they are good. They think they're good. And so Proverbs chapter 12, starting at verse 15, amen? Proverbs chapter 12, starting at verse 15. And we're going to look at the New King James Version. And it simply says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he who heeds counsel is wise. Again, fools are foolish because they don't want wisdom and instruction. Because they think they are right. I like the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Oh, and the message, it keeps it uh, clear too. And it says, fools are headstrong. Fools are headstrong. Fools are stubborn. Fools often think they know what they should do when they don't. But the message says, fools are headstrong and do what they like. Wise people take advice. And so fools despise wisdom and instruction. We already define what wisdom is. So now let me define to you what instructions are. Instructions are detailed information telling how something should be done. Again, instructions are Detailed information telling how something should be done. Instructions are a direction or order. Just being grown makes some people a fool. Being grown alone makes some people a fool because we feel like I'm grown. I'm not taking no orders or directions from nobody. Because I'm grown. Oh, yes, yeah, a whole bunch of grown fools in the kingdom, in the world. Grown fools. When do you get to the point where you don't have to receive instruction and wisdom and orders from anybody? Never. 
don't care how brilliant you are. I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how smart you are. Whatever the case may be. We all have to, at one time or another, be humble enough to know that we need wisdom. To be humble enough to know that God will put some people in your life that will give you some instructions to follow. Instructions. But we grow. We so grown. We want to do our own thing. We don't want all that. Look at your name, and I want you to look at your neighbor real good. And say, neighbor, <laughs> if that's you, you are just a grown fool. Look at somebody else and say it to them with some authority. Say, neighbor, if that is you, you are just a grown fool. Uh-huh. And so Elder Janetta shared in her teaching that God uses people to give us wisdom and instructions. Amen? Her emphasis was on wisdom, but as I said, wisdom and instruction go together when you look at the scriptures. And so God can use whoever he chooses. How many of y'all know that God can use whoever he chooses with without experience. Mm -hmm. Do you believe, do you really believe, because let me tell you something, this is how some people think. Yeah. Some people yeah. feel like if you ain't never experienced this, then you're not capable of giving me any wisdom. Does anybody believe that? Hmm. And be honest if that's how you feel. Like, okay, you, you do? Raise your hand. You do? Okay. <laughs> we got somebody that's honest enough, to, honest enough to say that for real, if you have never been in my shoes, if you never experience what I'm going through, then you don't have the ability to really give me good wisdom and instruction. Well, that's not true. Some people don't want to receive from some folks because they don't think the person really understands their situation. But newsflash, turn to 1 Corinthians, because I got to back it up with scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I got to back it up with scripture, and I got to show you in the scripture a prime example of how God can use somebody without experience in your situation to give you wisdom and instruction. And so a person does not have to experience a thing in order to give correct wisdom and instruction. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, is everybody there? Amen. Amen. The word of God says, let the husband... Render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body. I don't hear no hums. I better hear a hum right there, sir. Huh? Anyway, the wife... The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Well, okay, here, here's, some, here's some wisdom that's about to go forward. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. How many of y'all know he's saying, guess what? Don't hold out. Don't hold out on making love to each other. Unless y'all are both on, on the same page and you don't want to do it too long because guess what? You won't give room for the devil. And so it says in verse 6, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment, but for I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God. One in this manner and another in that. Who's writing this, people? Who's writing this scripture? Paul. Was Paul married? Paul was single. Paul was a single man of God. He had no wife. But guess what? Here he is in the word of God giving some wisdom and some good instruction. Don't clink, clink too long when you're married. Don't do it unless you're on one accord, but don't do it too long because guess what? You will give 
him for the death. And he's telling you this, and he ain't married. Does anybody believe that that's good wisdom and instruction? Yes. Hello. So sometimes a person may not have ever experienced what you are dealing with, but it does not mean that they can't give you good wisdom and instruction. On another note, however, you should really, somebody say, really, really? Really, really. really. You should really embrace, embrace wisdom and instruction from someone who has been in your shoes. Oh, yeah. You should really embrace wisdom and instruction from somebody who has literally been in your shoes. For example, if I was in debt, okay, before, and now I am debt free, if you are in bondage to debt and you have never, say never, 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 never. <laughs> and you've never been free, then guess what? If you want to get out, you should do what? Listen to me. Because if I was in a thing and I got out of a thing, trust me, I have some wisdom and I have some instructions to show you that it's been proven to work because of what I've done. So instead of you staying stuck and in bondage and in debt, then guess what? Listen to the wisdom. She talked about the millennials last week. And she was saying oftentimes the millennials, oftentimes they, you, they can be rebellious and sometimes they think they know everything. Well, let me tell you something. Baby, if you are 25 and I'm 50, I'm here to tell you, I do have more sense than you in a whole lot of areas. There's some things that you simply get from living long enough. But I've also been a child. I've also been a foolish Teenager. Because when you're a teenager, you think your mama dumb, you think your daddy dumb, you think they don't know nothing. Well, As if they ain't never been a teenager before. If they ain't never played the same games that you playing before. If they ain't came up with some of the same lies you telling to them, looking them straight in their face. And so the bottom line is you got to understand that there are some individuals that have been in your shoes, that have experienced some of the same things that you are experiencing. Because everybody that reaches the age of 20 or 30, we've been teenagers before. Yes. Yes. Those of us that are 50 and 60, we were 30 before. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And guess what? Sometimes we make some foolish mistakes. Do you realize we try to stop you from making some of the same foolish mistakes? Can I tell you something? You're going to learn one way. You're going to learn today. Amen? But you're going to learn by one or two ways. You're going to learn the hard way from experience, or you're going to learn from wisdom and avoid a lot of foolish mistakes. And I've said it before, it is amazing because people don't like wisdom. In general, people buck against wisdom. And as she said, wisdom will be your best friend. Wisdom got your back. Wisdom will put you on the right path. Wisdom will lead you. And God will use somebody to speak wisdom to you in your situation. But we, mm, no, that ain't my story. It ain't going to happen to me. Well, if I done seen this a hundred times, what make you think you've been a hundred and one person that it ain't going to happen to you? Do y'all realize that even when it comes down to the enemy, he don't use no new stuff? No. Same, same old stuff. Been. Same, old, same, old. same old stuff. He been setting people up for years. That's why you got all these women out here with these babies. I'm going to be for real. Sometimes you got a whole bunch of women out here with babies because they just trying to be loved. And they think that if I have this baby for this man, that he going to love me. And yeah, we have the babies that we're the man at. Because you can go back in time and look at Rachel and Leah. Okay? Uh -huh. He did not want Leah. Yeah. Hello? He did not want Leah. Leah, every time she had a rack of babies. If Leah was walking, she just had a whole basketball team behind her. Yeah. <laughs> and each time... She had a child, and each time 
time she got pregnant by him, her thing was, oh, this time he going to love me. He really going to love me this time. Uh, boo, no, he ain't. But what's evident in that is, guess what? He slept with her all the times, though. Oh, he ain't have a problem with hitting it. You going to be a fool and let him keep hitting it? He going to hit it, but guess what? He still ain't going to love you. So sometimes when we try to tell individuals certain things, then let me explain something to you. This ain't the way to get somebody to love you. This ain't the route to go. It don't work. Oftentimes it has the opposite effect. But you got individuals that feel like this stuff is gold. They feel like their stuff is just all that and some. And I, I, I got the whip a pill for real. <laughs> That's going to make this one be different than all them other ones you say. Really? Okay, I'll sit back and wait. And so the bottom line is we have to understand that there are individuals that have experienced things in life that can share with us wisdom that can truly help us. And so when it comes down to it, Word of advice, don't be quick to reject wisdom from someone who hasn't experienced what you are going through, but you should really be quick to receive experience or wisdom and instructions from somebody that has been in your shoes. Amen? And so, if I am an individual and I know straight up A, B, and C are guaranteed to get you to a place of being debt free, then why wouldn't you want to heed? You got to ask yourself, why wouldn't you want to heed the instructions and the wisdom given in A, B, and C if I'm telling you, look at me now. Let me tell you where I was, but look at me now. It's obvious I know something. And so, when you think about it, you got to continue to understand that people won't heed it because Proverbs 1, verse 7 Said fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so as we move forward in this teaching, keep in mind, a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. And so throughout the years, turn your Bibles to 2 Kings as we get ready to look at this scripture. I love this passage of scripture. Uh, I've only preached from it one time, but I love it. And we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 5. But when it comes down to it, I have been sought after for counsel, amen, by many individuals throughout the years. And I have come across a lot of Naamans. And you're going to understand what Naamans are like. But I've come across a lot of namings throughout the years from folks that have sought me for counseling, whether or not they came on their own or whether or not somebody else suggested that they come to me. And so I've been sought after for counsel by many throughout the years and come across many namings. And when you think about it, folks that seek help but don't like the instructions that are given. They seek help, but they don't like the instructions that are given. I wish... I could honestly say that many of the individuals that I've counseled throughout the years, I wish that I could say that many of them heeded like Naaman, despite them not agreeing with the method or understanding. But that hasn't always been the case. Hasn't always been the case, because a lot of times people like to learn the hard way. However, for those individuals that did heed the wise counsel and the instruction and the wisdom that was given to them, Guess what? They saw the benefits of obedience. So let us look at this passage of scripture. I'm going to put on my eyeglasses. I don't want to make a lot of mistakes and act like I can really see all of this. Amen. And so 2 Kings chapter 5, let's talk about this scripture right here. And it says, Naaman's leprosy heal. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, he was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Listen, y'all, name it. It says he was also a mighty man of valor, but I said some people are smart and gifted, but you have in there's always something after that but. 
Because people can be smart and gifted, but don't always heed or seek counsel. But this particular man, he had it going on. He was a man of valor, but a leper. He had issues. Just like many of us. He had an issue that was plaguing his life. Despite all the wonderful things that he did, he had an issue. And it says, and the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. She was Naaman's wife's servant. Amen. Naaman's wife, the little girl served Naaman's wife. And she was one that could see all that Naaman was dealing with as far as the leprosy. Amen. So then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Because sometimes you will come across individuals that know the mess that you are dealing with. And they will say to you, I know the person that you need to go see. I promise you, if you come in contact with this person, if you go see this person, that very thing that's been plaguing you year after year, I'm telling you, if you get with them, it can change. And she was like, man, you need to go and see the prophet. And so, it says, for he will heal him of his leprosy. Verse 4. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria, amen, uh, 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 then the king of Syria said, Go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. All right, he heard, okay, I need to go see this person, go send this letter. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may what? Heal him of his issue. Heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and he said, uh, am I God? You bringing this letter to me. Am I God? To kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, the one who had the ability to help him, when it was that Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, then he sent to the king saying, what, what's, what's going on? Why, why have you torn your clothes? I mean, I, I see you in great distress, distress. What's going on with you? Why have you torn your clothes? And he says, please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. You, king, don't have what this man needs. You tear your clothes, you trip it, but guess what? Send him to me. Because I know what he needs. And so, verse 9, it says, Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. He's ready, y'all. I'm in the place to get my healing. I know what I'm dealing with. I know what my issue is. I have gotten permission. The lady said, the young girl said, I need to see this prophet. And here I am in position. And it says he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha didn't go. But Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Those were instructions coming from the man of God who had what Naaman needed to be free from his issue. Oh, Naaman is about the straight trip. First of all, I came all this way, and you will see your servant? No, I came to see you. And so it goes on to say, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, <laughs> Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. Oh, come on. Don't he know who I am? I am the mighty man of valor. I'm coming to him, and he don't have 
enough respect to come out and see me and stand and call on the name of the Lord. Oh, you mean to tell me he ain't going to pray over me? He ain't going to slap me with some oil? He ain't going to lay hands? He ain't going to speak all kinds of words over me? He ain't going to move the mountains? Because sometimes we want to control how our deliverance is going to come. So that's the problem. We, we think it should be done like this. When at the end of the day, the question is, do you want to be delivered? Because you don't know how your deliverance is going to come. But we often want to control and dictate how things are done. You want to go to somebody. You want to seek counsel. But then you want to tell them how it should be done? The devil is a liar. First of all, the prophet could have said, baby, I ain't come looking for you. You came looking for me. So it's obvious that I got something that you need. So won't you humble yourself and follow the instructions that I'm giving you that's going to help you. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Sometimes we want a whole bunch of theatrics and ain't even like that. I just need you to pray every day. What? Pray every day. Pray. Read your word. No, nah, that ain't going to work. It's no way possible that that's going to work. Oh, no, I, I know it works. I know it works. Pray every day. Read your word every day. Well, every day is a bit too much, but at least I'll read it twice a week. You ain't going to get what you need. See, because sometimes when God is trying to be specific to get you what you need to get healed and delivered and set free, whatever it may be, he has specific instructions. But we always try to alter what God says. We don't want to do what he wants us to do to get what, what we need. And so, verse 12, are not the Abana and the Parfer, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? You mean to tell me you want me to go to the Jordan? Ain't nothing special about that water. I mean, I know some, I know some rivers that, that, that that's got clear water. You know, the Jordan may have a little bit of seaweed in it. You know, may have a little bit of jellyfish. I'm just in my own head right now. All this other stuff. But you want the waters of Bahamas instead of the Bahamas. No, no, no. I know what you need. He's basically telling them, I know what you need. It's in this water with these instructions that you will get what you need. But he says, if the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel, could I not wash in them and be clean? That's how we are. Well, well you know, we, we want to bargain with God. Sometimes when it comes down to wisdom and instructions and trying to give what we need, we want to bargain with God. Okay, I understand I need to wash, but can I wash here? Can it happen here and I can be clean? And so, he turned and he went away in rage, angry, upset, because what he wanted didn't come packaged the way he wanted it. So he went away in rage, and here it is, his boy is with him. And he said, for real, dude, you tripping. I'm paraphrasing, but he said, young, let me tell you something. We came all the way out here to see this prophet that has what you need to help you. And you won't catch an attitude and just leave. Uh, uh, excuse me, can you please look at your hand? Can you look at your skin? You still got leprosy. You still jacked up. You still got le leprosy. And you don't want to follow instructions. So his servant turned and went away. He turned away and went away. And his servants came and near and spoke to him and said, My father. If the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? Mm. See, if it would have been on the level of what you expected, you would have easily did it. I had a conversation with a young man the other day, and it was a good conversation. 
And he was he was going through, uh, in the beginning, he was going through about an assignment that he was given at his church. And it's one of those platform services where they want you to uh, minister for 10 minutes. Right? Seven people, seven observers, wanted you to minister for 10 minutes. And he was like, Apostle, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. I'm, I'm feeling some kind of way, you know, uh, about this, you know, because, you know, the, the mother of the church, the one that's over there, she came to me and was like, I want you to preach. And, you know, I, I don't know what this is. I'm having this feeling. And then he said, but if prophet so-and-so would have asked me to do something, I mean, I wouldn't, have a, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I said, stop the bus right there. I said, prophet so-and-so is the pastor of that church. So anything that goes on in that church, that prophet knows what's taking place. That prophet has approved it, but because it didn't come straight from the prophet's mouth, you're having an issue with it because of who it's coming from. I said, you better get it together. See, because sometimes we can get caught up on the vessel. We can get caught up in the how or the why. But the reality of it is, like he said, if the prophet would have asked you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? And the reality of it, he would have done it with no problem. But again, because it's not what you thought, it becomes a challenge. And so, he said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Whether there's something great in your eyes, come on now, you would have did that if it was great. But now he said, wash and be clean. So you know what? He got himself together. He got over himself. He stopped tripping. He listened to some people that had enough heart to really rebuke him. His servants rebuked him. And so it goes on to say, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the instructions, saying of the man of God, according to the saying of the man of God, and guess what, y'all? His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And then he returned to the man of God. Can you imagine? He tripping in his mind. Please understand, in his mind, he's not thinking it's going to work in the Jordan. The Jordan of all places, he's not thinking that it's going to work. But when he heated, when he humbled himself, and he did the simple thing. Get in the water, turn around seven times. Your mind will tell you, again, that ain't going to work. I mean, I've been praying to God and he ain't healed it. If you tell me to just get wet and turn around, and that's going to heal it, it worked, following instructions. And after he returned, after, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides and came and stood before him and he said, indeed now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged them to take it, but he refused. He was tripping in the beginning. He didn't like what he needed to go through. To get his deliverance, his healing. But when he finally obeyed, he saw that it was worth it. Obedience is for your benefit. Amen. And know that disobedience to instructions can be detrimental. Go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 13. God is serious about his instructions. Whether it comes through a person, whether it comes directly from him, whether it comes from his word, whether it comes in your spirit, man. He's serious about his instructions. When we saw how simple disobedience put things on the downward spiral back in the garden. But here's a passage of scripture where you're going to see that disobedience can be detrimental. 1 Kings chapter 13, and I'm going to start at verse 4. And what's taking place prior to verse 4 is that you have the man of God that is actually praying and declaring some things that's going to take place. And the king of this region hears it, and he don't like it. Okay? He doesn't like it. He has an issue with it. He basically tries to curse the man 
who was uh, uh, saying the prayers and things before the altar, the king in the midst of him trying to curse the man, his hand shriveled up. Don't mess with God's people. His hand shriveled up. So now let us look at verse 4. Verse 4, and it says, So it came to pass when King Jeroboam, Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him! Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, he got to change the heart now. First of all, you trying to curse this man, but now you really realize this joker got some kind of power. So now that your hand all withered up, the very one that you was coming against, now you need his help. Don't burn your bridges. <laughs> and so he says, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Oh, you want me to pray? You ain't like what I was praying a minute ago. But now you want me to pray for you so that you can be restored. So guess what? The man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Now, the king said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. The devil is a liar. You got issues with me. You think I'm going to come sit and have a feast with you? Do you really? I, I realize why your hand was shriveled up. Now, I pray because I'm a man of God. God heard my prayer. It was restored. But guess what, baby? I ain't trying to kick it with you. I ain't trying to kick it with you. And so, he says, come home with me and refresh yourselves and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you. Nor would I eat bread nor water, drink water in this place. He's like, I, you can give me your house. You can try to give me anything. I ain't fellowshipping with you like that. Because I already know your spirit. I already know you foul. He knew this was a foul king. He was like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. And so, verse 9, it says, this is key, y'all. Instructions that came to this man of God from the Lord. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way, and he did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came, and he told him all the works of the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. They told him what the Lord spoke to the man and how he ain't supposed to eat, how he's supposed to drink. So then he went back and gave his message to their father, the old prophet. And their father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So he saddled the donkey for him and he rode on it and he went after the man of God and found him sitting under the oak. Then he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread, nor drink water with you in this place. For I, you better know, without a shadow of a doubt, what the Lord told you. Because God will test you in your obedience. And so, he said, I am not supposed to eat or drink water in this place with you. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. So now he want to get him with this. Everybody 
got a title, don't trust them. Everybody that try to throw their position around, don't always trust them, especially when you know what God said to you. So he said to him, okay, he ain't gonna do, that ain't going to get him. Let me see if I can get him with this. He said, I too am a prophet. Oh, that was the thing right there. Oh, you just like me? You're a prophet too? Amen. Amen. I mean, if you're a prophet just like me, then we should be good. So the man said, I too am a prophet as you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. The bottom line is, I don't care what somebody said. If that ain't what God said to you and you got the instructions from God, I don't care what somebody else said. If God hasn't told you something different, you better stick with what God said to you. Because sometimes you'll be tested. You'll be tried. But you got to stand on what you know to be true. Follow the instructions of God. Because again, your disobedience can be detrimental. Verse 19, so he went back with him. And he ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah and said, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place which the Lord said to you that you should not do these things? He said, guess what? Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your father. So it was, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. He tricked him. And then this thing is, but didn't, didn't God tell you not to? Sometimes you got to, again, know what the Lord has said to you. The instructions that God has said to you. And don't alter them. You can't alter them. And because he did not obey the clear instructions, don't eat, don't drink, go a different way. Well, the way I went is shorter. And going another way is going to just take me out of my way. <laughs> don't eat, don't drink, and go a different way. He disobeyed, he died. Disobedience can be detrimental to your life when you don't heed instructions. But we see clearly that if you heed the instructions, dip yourself in the joy, turn around seven times, and you will be healed. It pays to obey. So in conclusion, I want to encourage everyone, underneath the sound of my voice, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Wisdom is your friend, not your enemy. She will never lead you astray. And so Elder Janetta closed with Proverbs chapter 4, and guess what? I'm closing with Proverbs chapter 4, the New Living Translation. And it says, my children, listen when your father corrects you. Who is your father? Those individuals that God has put in your life as authority figures. Father, not necessarily meaning of a male type in the spirit realm. Because God assigns people to your spiritual life. Your leaders, your pastors, your elders. He assigned these people in your life to lead you and to guide you. But here you have a dad talking with his son. And it says, my children, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment. For I am giving you good guidance. Your leaders hear from the Lord. And it is their desire to give you good guidance. Individuals that you seek God from, for. You may seek God. You know you need wise counsel. And God will lead you to who you need to go 
to, then guess what? You need to go to them believing that he's going to give you good counsel. May not be what you want to hear. I just, I was going through some stuff in my house the other day, and I came across a journal. And when me and my husband was dating, we met on Memorial Day. And I was reading in one of my journals where I was like, okay, we're going to get married on Memorial Day. How many of y'all know the good guidance and the counsel from the one that we trusted told us, no, y'all need to wait another year before y'all do this. We had our plan. It was altered. But if we went to her for what, for wisdom and counsel, and she gives it to us, why would we re re uh, refuse it? I was like, wow, okay. We, we had our plan, but that got changed. We knew our plan got changed, but I didn't remember the date. But when I read that, I was like, oh, we, we, in our mind, we was getting married on the day that we met. That ain't happened. And so, pay attention and learn good judgment, for I am giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions. For I, too, was once my father's son. He said, I've been in your shoes. I ain't always been grown. I ain't always been where I am. I was in your shoes before. So I, too, was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart. Follow my commands, and you will live. Follow my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom. Develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she what? will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing that you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head, and she will present you with a beautiful crown. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back. Do y'all see how powerful this passage of scripture is that's telling you all the benefits that come from a heeding to wisdom. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions and don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. He's telling you, and I stand before you today, don't do as the wicked do. Don't follow the path of the evil doers. Always say, I don't care if everybody's doing this. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. Whew. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. I had to call and check somebody the other day. And I said, the reality is, oh, this is what you're doing now? I said, you're supposed to be in a new place. Getting your life to be better, making your life better, making a better life for you and your daughter. And this is what you're doing? Well, I mean, you know, I, I just want to have fun. So, so your, your thing of fun is now, now you want to start just engaging and getting high and clubbing and doing all type of stuff that you're doing. Because now you done went down there and you are now doing what everybody else is doing. I don't care what everybody else is doing. A whole bunch of people's lives are falling apart because that's what everybody else is doing. Hear me clearly. Young people, and I'm talking to you, I don't care what everybody else is doing. No, because you're at that age now. And we want to do what everybody else is doing. Hear me today. Doing what everybody else is doing will make you late. Well, it will make you late. Because most people, look at me again. Because most people your age ain't trying to live holy. They ain't trying to be a good representation of God. 
They want to do everything that they want to do. That they look at me, what their flesh wants them to do. And you are in the most trying phase in your life right now. And I tell you one thing. You need to take all this wisdom that you have received over these years. Because just like the young prophet was tested, you too will be tested. Your testing ground will come when you leave from the presence and the covering of your mother. When you leave from the presence and the covering of this house, when you go away. If you don't heed, hear me. If you don't heed to wisdom, it will be detrimental to you. The devil wants to take you out. Why? Because there's been so many powerful prophecies that have been spoken over your life. Because of the call of God that's on your life, Satan hates you. He wants you to be a statistic. You can't do what everybody else does. You are different. Embrace it. Don't do as the wicked do and don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep moving. For evil people can't sleep until they've done their evil deeds for the day. They can't rest until they call someone to stumble. They want to cause you to stumble. Evil people want you to do the wrong that they're doing. They eat the food of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they are stumbling over. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they will bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. It goes on to say, guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. What's in your heart is what you will do. Get your heart right. Because your heart will lead you where you don't need to go. Let your mind take authority over your heart. And so guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. This is the word of the Lord. What you talking about? What are your conversations like? Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on the safe path. The world will tell you that the safe path ain't no fun. That's what the world will tell you, that the safe path ain't no fun. Okay. That wide road is a beast. And it's a long, a lot of stuff to come with. But the word of God tells us to stay on the narrow path. Stay on the safe path, even though your flesh don't like it. Your flesh don't want to please God. When people of God are going to understand your flesh will never want to please God. Your flesh will never want to do what the word wants to do. Your flesh will never want to obey the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Your flesh is foul. It's wicked. And it wants you to obey it. But the word of God says, stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Distractions. You remember you preached that word? Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. 
We got to understand. Wisdom needs to be your best friend. Wisdom needs to be your best friend. Because wisdom will protect you from a lot of unnecessary foolishness. You don't have to go out here and get a testimony of how you messed up but got it back together. I'll never forget my daughter Jasmine said, <coughs> I always hear the stories about people that are messed up. Now they're on the right path. Is there ever anybody that doesn't mess up? Is there ever anybody that do things right from Jump Street? And most of the time she was talking about relationships in the context of relationships. Do you have any women that really keep themselves, any men that really keep themselves until their marriage day? Or is the story always, as soon as I met him, yes, we failed, we did it. We, I got with her, we did it again and again and again. Is this the story every time? Same stuff, different day, same stuff, different dude, same stuff, different woman? But is there ever a real testimony that's going to come where somebody can say, it was a struggle. The struggle was real, but I still. The struggle was real. I wanted to, but I stayed on the safe path. I pray this teaching has been a blessing. Obedience is everything. Disobedience can be detrimental to your life. Wisdom needs to be your best friend. And if you don't know what to do, seek wise counsel. And when you seek wise counsel, don't take your happy self up in their presence trying to tell them what you need for your issue. Let them hear from the Lord, lead you and guide you, and you need to obey. Go to the Jordan, turn around seven times, and you shall be healed. Amen? Amen. Amen.